Well, as I promised, I'm going to do this practice final exam. And I hope that everyone has already worked it through. And you can see whether your answers agree with mine. And I'll explain what I had in mind when I wrote these various questions. As an undergraduate, probably the single most useful class I ever had was when Wendell Furry, who was teaching a year-long graduate course in electrodynamics, gave back the exams for the first half of the course and explained what he'd had in mind with each question. Because it had never occurred to me before that, that any thought went into constructing exams. So for those of you who are interested in teaching or who already teach and want to compare notes, this might be interesting, even if you've got all the right answers. And I should say, someone got 100% on this exam last year. Uh, someone got 49 out of 50. Uh, he already had a master's degree and was going into a PhD program. And the third person got 92%, and he was just admitted early decision to Brown. So uh, if, you're, if you're in the 90s in this exam, you're in really good company. And <clears throat> if you're 70 or better, you're in perfectly reasonable shape. OK, I'm going to work the multiple choice items first. And one of the secrets of doing multiple choice items, I would say, is work the question and then see whether you got one of the answers. Don't try to work backwards from the answers and try to guess which one has to be correct, particularly if they're all numerical and arranged in ascending order. So uh, the first one looks to me like an inclusion-exclusion question, because we have three events, a red card. So this is question one. which I'll call R. And the probability of getting a red card is given as 0 0.6. The probability of getting a red face card is 0 0.32. That's the probability of R intersect F. And finally, the probability of getting a card that's either a red card or a face card is specified to be 0 0.8. And what you're supposed to figure out is the probability of a face card. Well, this is a backhanded inclusion-exclusion question. There are four items included in the inclusion-exclusion principle. And we're given three of them here, though not the usual three. So we can start with P of R union F equals P of R plus P of F minus P of R intersect F. And put in the numbers, we've got 0 0.8 equals P of R, which is 0 0.6 plus P of F, which is unknown, minus P of R intersect F which is 0 0.32. And therefore, P of F is equal to 0 0.8 minus 0 0.6 plus 0 0.32, which is 0 0.52. And one of the nice things about multiple choice items is if you make a really stupid mistake in arithmetic, uh, you'll get an answer that wasn't included. Here, 0 0.52 is there. It's choice C. And that's the right answer. Questions? OK, I'll move right on to question two then. Somehow I don't think I'm going to make it through the exam with that marker, though. It's dry over reliable <coughs> red. Very difficult to see. That's uh, okay. Okay, this is question two. Uh, a craps question. Uh, you roll a total of five with your two dice, so your point is five. Now you keep rolling the dice until you again roll a five, in which case you win, or a seven, in which case you lose. What's your conditional probability of winning once you've rolled the initial five? Uh, well, I'll denote by S5 and S7 
the probability of rolling a 5 and a 7. And the question is, given that the roll is either a 5 or a 7, what's the probability that it's a 5? There are lots of ways to do this problem, but this is probably the simplest. Well, the probability of a 5 is the four ways of rolling a 5, which are 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 2, and 4, 1, over 36. The probability of rolling a 7 is 6 over 36. And this probability is therefore equal to 436 divided by 436 plus 636, which is 4 tenths or 2 fifths. And I would think it would be entirely reasonable to look at this one and say there's four ways of rolling a 5, six ways of rolling a 7. Nothing else matters. That's 4 out of 10. You can do it in your head. Just a little more formal. Questions about this one? And as I hinted last week, these questions may have appeared on the practice exam because there was a matching longer problem on the exam that you're going to get next week. Uh, three, boys and girls. Um, family has 10 children, seven boys, and three girls. And you want to figure out the probability that there were always more boys than girls in the family. Uh, you spot this as a ballot theorem question if you say, oh, that's the same thing as there are seven votes for candidate A, three votes for candidate B. What's the probability that candidate A is always ahead? Or Harvard and Yale play seven football games. Harvard wins seven. Yale wins three. What's the probability that the games were played in such an order that Harvard was always ahead? So this is just one storyline for a ballot theorem question. And here's what we've got. We've got excess boys plotted against the number of children. So the growth of this family is a random walk where uh, a boy counts as a step in one direction, a girl counts as a step in another. And after 10 steps, there are four more boys than girls. And never after the first birth is the number of children of either sex equal. The ballot theorem says level gain of 4 over number of steps gives you the fraction of the paths that have that property. Questions? OK, well, we're breezing right through this. Uh, OK, number 4. This is a generating function question. And I've already given you a pretty broad hint that uh, the only generating function questions that I'll put on a final exam are going to have some family resemblance to this. Because this basically uh, puts everything you know about generating functions into one question and gives you a chance to use the negative binomial expansion as well. So we've got four dice. We add up the numbers. And the first question is to write down the generating function for one die, which we've done many times before, and for four dice. So for one die, well, there's the probability of 1 sixth of each of the outcomes. And since the smallest number that can show up is a 1, we have 1 power of s in everything. That's a perfectly correct answer. But since I know what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to go right ahead and write this as f over s over 6 times 1 minus s to the 6th over uh, 1 minus s. Let's give that a name, a g1 of s. 
And then for four dice, it's easy. This is where the generating function pays off. Generating function for four dice is s to the fourth over six to the fourth times one minus s six to the fourth divided by one minus s. Now we want to calculate the probability that the sum on the four dice is 11. And the way to do that is to take advantage of the fact that the answer to this question is just the coefficient of s to the 11th when we write this out. So all we have to do is expand everything and identify all the terms that have s to the 11th, this being a final exam where time is at a premium. There are only two such terms. So we've got s to the fourth over 6 to the fourth times 1 minus s to the sixth to the fourth. That's 1 minus 4 s to the sixth. The next term is x to the twelfth, so it doesn't matter. And then we've got to do 1 minus s to the minus fourth. Now, I'll tell you, I actually went to the last page of the exam and check the statement of the negative binomial theorem to make sure I had this exactly right. It starts out 1 plus 4s, which is actually 4 choose 1s. Now, there are a whole bunch more terms. This, this, and this will give me s to the 11th. The only other way to get s to the 11th, though, is s to the 4th here and an s to the 7th here. And uh, actually, four choose three, right? yeah. it's 4 choose 3 or 4 choose 1. There are two equivalent ways of writing this out. But the simpler one always has the same symbol on the bottom here. So we've got something choose 3. Uh, 1 plus 3 is 4. 7 plus 3 is 10. So there we go. And the coefficient of s to the 11th. is 1 over 6 to the 4th times, well, we've got a term with a plus sign, which is 10 choose 3 times s to the 11th. And then we've got a term with a minus sign, which is 4 times 4 choose 3. Um, that's absolutely correct. And it says you may leave your answers in terms of binomial coefficients and powers of 6. Or you may express it as a fraction in lowest terms with a denominator of 162. I would say, faced with that situation, I'd say, I'm going to go through. I'm going to work the rest of the exam. But one of my top priorities after I've answered every question is to come back, simplify this answer, and check that the d denominator is 162 once I get it into lowest terms. So what have we got? 1 over 6 to the 4th times 10 times 9 times 8 over 3 times 2. That's a 3. That's a 4 minus 16. That's 104 over 6 to the 4th. And this is divisible by 8. That's 8 times 13 over 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 3 of the 2's kill the 8. And what do you know? It's 13 over 164, which is also a correct answer. And particularly easy, oh, 162, excuse me. Particularly easy to grade because someone's highly unlikely to get that by accident. Okay. Questions about this one? No, but I'll, then I'll do the next one. OK. Uh, the next one is a baseball bonus question, but it's entirely equivalent, for example, to the question, you find a casino where you automatically win your bet if zero comes up on the roulette wheel, so the odds are in your favor. 
you start with a certain amount of money, what's the probability that you will go broke in the course of the evening as a function of the number of dollars you start with? Uh, here we have a question where the event that terminates things is on the upper end. The deal is we've got a baseball player who, like all baseball players, has a smaller probability for getting a hit than for making an out. And the deal is they will keep a running total as the season goes on of hits and outs. And if at any point he's got two more hits than outs, he gets a big bonus. Clearly, this is going to happen early in the season, if at all. And to get you started, I've asked you to show all the ways that the player can earn the bonus after precisely four trips to the plate. This will encourage you to think of it as a random walk. So the question is, what's the probability of reaching level two for the first time after four steps? Well, one way to do it is like that. In fact, you have to end up with two hits. Because if you don't have two hits as uh, at bat three and at bat four, he would have got there earlier. The other possibility is an out followed by three hits. So there are two ways of doing this. And the probability of this event is equal to two, because there are two ways of doing it, times the probability of either of these. And each of these involves three hits, which have a probability of one third, and one out with a probability of two thirds. So we put this together, and we get four over 81. Everyone in agreement with me so far? OK. Uh, um, I have a question. Yes. Why couldn't you go? Um, Oh, I see. If you went up and then you came back. You can't go straight up because that would mean he gets the bonus after two times right. okay. to the play. Uh, this is just to get you thinking. There's some probability, in fact, uh, one chance in nine that he will win the bonus after two times to the plate. Uh, then there's this probability you'll win it after four times to the plate. And if the final answer you get is not larger than the sum of those two things, you'll have done something wrong. OK, uh, this is almost exactly like the one I did in lecture and that you've had a bit of chance to practice with on the homework. Uh, this would have made a nice quiz question. But there wasn't a quiz to put it on, so it's showing up on the final. But it's easy to write lots and lots of questions like this. And I think this is an important enough idea that I want to encourage you to get this technique down pat so you can apply it in different situations. Because as done abstractly with symbols rather than numbers, both in lecture and in the book, it's a little bit hard to swallow, whereas fundamentally it's really quite easy. So. We want to use conditional probability. And we want a condition on whether the first at bat is a hit. So f sub k is the probability that he gets the bonus if he needs two excess hits in order to get it. Well, what can happen when he goes up to bat for the first time? He could get a hit, which happens with probability 1 third. And if he gets a hit, then he's only one short of the bonus. So uh, the probability of going on to win the bonus is now f sub k minus 1. More likely, he will make an out. Now he has to get k plus 1 excess hits in order to claim the bonus. So this is f sub k plus 1. So um, that's the recurrence for this. 
And now we have to solve this. And the way you solve this, though I basically told you how to do it in the problem, is to know that there are always two solutions of the form x to the k. So let's plug in x to the k for f sub k, x to the k minus 1 for f sub k minus 1, x to the k plus 1 for f sub k plus 1, and now factor out x to the k minus 1. So we have x equals 1 third plus 2 thirds x squared. And if I write this in more conventional form by multiplying through by 3 and collecting terms, I get 2x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals 0, which factors into 2x minus 1 times x minus 1 equals 0. So the two possible solutions to this are x to the k where x equals 1, that is a constant, or uh, x equals 1 half. And the general solution is that f sub k is a linear combination of the two, a times 1 to the k, or just a, plus b times 1 half to the k. Now the boundary conditions here are simpler than any we've dealt with. Probabilities cannot be greater than 1. And uh, furthermore, the probability that he would be able to win this bonus if he needed uh, 10,000 more hits than outs is 0. So we know that this quantity has to approach 0 as k approaches infinity. And the only value of a that makes that possible is 0. So the answer is just a constant times 1 half to the k. But if it takes 0 excess hits to win the bonus, he's already got it. So b has to equal 1. And the solution is f sub k equals 1 half to the k. A surprisingly simple result uh, in the case given, f sub 2 equals 1 fourth. Uh, and I defy you to get that simple answer by looking at this problem unsystematically and trying to sum an infinite series. There may be a way of doing it, but it certainly isn't simple. I Catherine, just, question? I, I, I missed what you said when um, how you get b equal to 1. I get b equal to 1 because I know that f sub 0 equals 1. Right? If he gets a bonus the first time he has equal numbers of hits and outs, he can claim his bonus right at the start of the season. So the probability of getting the bonus is, zero, is 1 in that case. So there really are two boundary conditions. One boundary condition is that this quantity starts at 1 for k equals 0. The other boundary condition is that it approaches 0 when k gets very large. Yeah, Dana? Maybe I'm picking nits, but it seems like there's three solutions for x, one of which is non-trivial, the other one being x equals 0. No, x equals 0 doesn't solve the equation. x equals 0 is not a root of this quadratic. Yeah, but it is of the one above, because you divided out x to the k minus 1. And it does look like it solves the original Oh, so you're saying a trivial solution to this, which I lose, is, um, you're absolutely right, um, a trivial solution to this recurrence is that f sub k is 0, and that fails to satisfy the boundary condition 
that it seems like that's a, is just as good a trivial answer as x equals one being hmm. the other <laughs> essentially trivial. Yes, uh, I would say if you and wanted to obviously being the if you wanted to say one. x could equal zero, one, or one half, and since you only wanted two of them, I'd give you zero and a half. I will accept that for full credit. Uh, have a full general solution. Um, that is true. In other words, Dana's answer, though technically correct, has uh, the problem that in most problems of this sort, you won't get the right answer because you need the solution with x equals 1 to fit the boundary conditions. Okay. Speaking of trivially correct answers, I haven't got to tell my helicopter story, have I? <laughs> uh, this one's so good, I like to use it in every course. Um, the story is that there were some people flying in a helicopter over uh, the state of Washington, um, somewhat north of Seattle, on a terribly cloudy day. And their navigation system failed. They had no idea where they were. And the pilot said, well, look, the only thing I can think of doing is we'll descend through the cloud comer, hope we can see someone on the ground and ask them. So they descended through the crowd clouds. They saw this big industrial complex surrounded by a parking lot and there was someone uh, standing uh, outside and they yelled down to him, hey, can you tell us where we are? And he yelled back, yes, you're in a helicopter. And the passenger said, fine, I know exactly where we are. The pilot said, where? He said, we're over Microsoft Technical Support Headquarters. How did you know that? Well, the answer was technically correct but conveyed no useful information. Uh, okay, next. Uh, okay, here is a catch-all question involving intersections, unions, complements, De Morgan's theorem, and fundamentals of probability. And the main skill that's needed is to take events described verbally and convert them correctly into sets. So we've got a random four-letter word that's posted on a website. And uh, certain properties of this word, namely events that we can assign probabilities to. And what we're given is that the event starts with a consonant, happens with a probability of 0 0.8. We're also given event B has probability 0 0.3, and that ends with a vowel. And might be worth noting right away that the probability of B complement is therefore 0 0.7. That's the probability that it ends in a consonant. And finally, we're given one more obscure piece of information. Now, we all know there is a 2 by 2 grid that can be made out of these things. And what you need is basically three pieces of information because the probability that something happens is always equal to one. That's your fourth piece of information. So the extra event for which we're given a probability is event C. That has a probability of 0 0.6. It begins and ends with a consonant. OK, there are a large number of ways to skin this particular cat. And I'll show you two or three of them, all of which, of course, lead to the same answer. The first one is express 
event C in terms of events A and B. Well, that's pretty easy. Event C is an intersection of event A and event B complement. That's an easy two points and a good start for later on. Next question, are events A and B independent? Justify your answer, which means that simply writing down no does not qualify for good full credit. Uh, probably the easiest way of doing this is to consider the two events A and B complement, uh, since we have the probability of A intersect B complement. Probability of A intersect B complement is equal to 0 0.6. The probability of A times the probability of B complement is 0 0.8 times 0 0.7, which is 0 0.56. So the probability of the intersection of the two events is different from the, prob from the product of their probabilities and wait a minute yeah that's right okay and they're not independent here's another way of doing it that is equally good uh, you can work out the probability of A intersect B, that's equal to the probability of A minus the probability of A intersect B complement. Because if A occurs and B complement doesn't occur, you've got the probability that A and B both occur. Probability of A is 0.8. This probability is 0 0.6, which is 0 0.2. But the probability of A times the probability of B is not 0 0.2. So they're not independent. OK, next question. Event D is that the word has a consonant at the beginning, at the end, or both at the beginning and at the end. I state it as a general rule that whenever I say or, I mean or in the sense of union, but I didn't want to take any chances here of someone misinterpreting this, so I spelled it out in detail. Express this event in terms of A and B. Well, that is the union of starts with a consonant and ends with a consonant, A union B sub C, and we can calculate its probability by inclusion exclusion. That's P of A plus P of B complement minus P of A intersect B complement which is 0 0.8 plus 0 0.7. And how convenient, we're given A intersect B complement as an event with specified probability, minus 0 0.6. That's 0 0.9. OK, last question. If you know that today's word ends in a vowel, What's the conditional probability that it also begins with a vowel? Um, so we want to know the probability that it begins with a vowel. That's event A complement. Given that it ends with a vowel, probability B. And that is, of course, the probability of the intersection, A complement intersect B divided by 
the probability of b. The easiest way to do this is to note that this event is the complement of event d. That is, if you spot the chance to apply De Morgan's theorem that the complement of a union is the intersection of the complements, you can say this is the probability of d complement divided by the probability of b. The probability of d complement is 1 minus the probability of d, and you get 1 third. There are numerous other ways of doing this, which are a little more long-winded, all lead to the same answer. But if I had time to kill at the end of the exam and wanted to check this, I think what I would do is to fill in this grid to make sure that everything checks. We've got the probability of A intersect B complement is 0 0.6. The probability of A intersect B is 0 0.2. What else do we have? Uh, the probability of A complement intersect B is 0 0.1. And therefore, the probability of A complement intersect B complement must also be 0 0.1. So that's a way of checking everything. Questions about this? OK. Uh, this next one is um, very seasonal, since uh, we've just passed Epiphany Sunday. And this is actually a true story. The Elizabeth in question is uh, Elizabeth Windsor, the long-suffering director of Christian education at my church who lets me teach all these crazy courses. And the first one I caught, taught was uh, what every Christian should know about quantum mechanics, which she passed on when I said that uh, when I said that you needed to know a little bit about imaginary numbers, and she said she'd never understood imaginary numbers. And then the next time I did faith probability and Bayesian inference, that gave rise to the Bayesian Bible. Uh, and for that one, she said, well, she'd never really been very good at fractions either, so she was going to pass on that one. Uh, <laughs> Nonetheless, I walked into church, and she'd had the kids bake this stuff called Three Kings Cake. And the tradition for Three Kings Cake is you bake stars into some of the pieces. And I think the deal is, if you get a star, you have to bake the cake next year or something like that. Uh, but she was worried, since I didn't know about these stars, that I was going to break a tooth. And I picked it up and said, hey, look out, Paul. Some of these have stars baked into them. Would you like a different one? Elizabeth, that's a Monty Hall problem. So here it is, uh, the Three Kings Monty Hall problem. And because it's a Monty Hall problem, we know that after we've worked it all out very carefully, there's going to be a simple check based on the fact that I have a certain probability of having picked up a star in the piece of cake that I chose initially. And that probability is not going to be changed what, by whatever Elizabeth, acting like Monty Hall, is going to do. So this is question seven now. And part A says, when the cake was baked, what is the probability that piece 1 had star s1 and piece 5 had star s2? Well, there are at least two ways of doing this and getting the right answer. Probably the simplest is to say uh, there's one chance in 5 that uh, piece 1 has the first star in it. And since the deal is the two stars have to be in different pieces of cake, the remaining star has to be in one of the other four pieces, because there are precisely two stars. So 1 fifth times 1 fourth equals 1 20th. 
Another way of doing this, uh, which is more in tune with what's going to follow, is to say if we take two distinguishable stars and three blanks represented by x's, there are five factorial ways of putting those five objects into five pieces of cake. There are three factorial ways of permuting the three objects that are not stars, and three factorial over five factorial is also equal to 120th. Another way of doing this is to say, look, there are 20 pairs of stars, and uh, the probability that one specific pair, sorry, there are 20 ordered pairs of stars, and the probability that one specific ordered pair, namely number 1 and number 5, will show up is 1 in 20. OK, uh, second one also for one point. What's the probability that the two stars were in uh, piece 1 and piece 5? And the answer is twice what you got before, because you could either have the situation described, star S1 in piece 1 and star S2 in piece 5. Uh, and you could also have them the other way around. This, I've used this on exams before, but this is really a better homework problem than an exam problem. It's a little bit too didactic. Uh, if you have never heard of the Monty Hall problem and keep your wits about you, um, you're going to end up with the right answer on this one because it leads you through all the steps of the reasoning, which is a great thing to do on homework, a uh, slightly questionable thing to do on a final exam. OK, event B is the smallest available star was in piece 5, and the deal is that Elizabeth chooses the smaller of the two stars if she has a choice. So now we have to make a table of all the ways this can happen. There are 20 outcomes for the positioning of the stars, and there are five of them that correspond to event B. First, there's this one. And then there are four more like that, uh, where star S2 is in piece 5, but star S1 is in one of the other pieces. And finally, there's the case where. Shouldn't it be the other way around, where uh, S1 is in 5 and S2 is in the other? Yeah. It doesn't matter, but according it, to the, uh, the problem. Yes, it does. You're absolutely right. As I specified, the smaller star is called S1. And finally, there's the case where S1's in the piece that I've picked up. So the only star that's left is the large star. That's S2. And Elizabeth has to break open this piece of cake to show it to me. And so the probability of this event B is equal to 5 over 20, which is 1 fourth. And that's quite reasonable, because there's nothing fundamentally different about the four pieces of cake that I don't have, numbers 2, 3, 4, and 5. Elizabeth has to break one of them open, and therefore it's a reasonable check that if you pick one of these more or less arbitrarily, there's one chance in four that that's the one she cracks open. In fact, I think that's a perfectly legitimate way of getting the correct answer. Um, OK? That Can you was just, part. The, the last one, the, the, I guess I'm, um, the, the example where in your last one where the large star is in five. She 
she's playing by the Monty Hall rules. Right. She's not allowed to break open my piece of cake. Right. And given a choice, she always reveals the smaller of the two stars. Right. But in the case where I've got the smaller star, she has to reveal the large one. That's the same as the case where Monty Hall has to uh, reveal the older goat because the younger goat is behind the door that I picked. Right. I guess I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand that in connection with the language that's in the question. Because that says the smallest one was in piece five. No, the smallest available one. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she yeah, has to pick uh, okay. from the four pieces yeah. of cake that I'm not holding. She has to take the one that has the smallest star. Uh, An equivalent formulation of this problem is uh, she, she picks at random yeah. if she has a choice. Uh, but I have found the problem is much cleaner if you have some criterion like smallest or oldest for choosing between them. I, I should also say, um, with the sole exception of the Christine's random dessert problem, where Shay and Marty swap one place, every Monty Hall problem I've ever heard of, you can do in your head once you catch on. And the funny thing is, given the debate over this problem, uh, the secret of getting these right is the obvious answer is always correct. Uh, I was explaining this problem. I got together with some former speech recognition colleagues last week, and I was explaining this over dinner. And I had an email from the former director of foreign marketing, and he said, we've been discussing nothing over dinner for the past few days, but that problem you explained uh, last Friday night. And I'm pretty sure I understand it, but how do I answer a person who says such and such? So I'm just going to send him back the notes from this course about the problem and hope that satisfies him. OK, uh, what have we got? We got part D now. Part D is. Event A is Paul has a star in piece one. Given that event B has occurred, determine the conditional probability of A. So that's the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. And the probability of A intersect B is equal to 2 out of 20, because here are the two situations where Elizabeth cracks open piece 5 of cake and Paul has the star. The probability of B is 5 out of 20, and that's 2 fifths. And that has to be right, because there are two stars. Paul picks one of five pieces of cake. He has two chances in five of having a star in the cake that he's got. And since Elizabeth is playing by Monty Hall's protocol, that's Sturzacher's term for this, that probability doesn't change. So this answer has to be 2 fifths. And uh, the last question is, if Paul exchanges piece one for piece two, What's the probability that he then has the star? Well, that would mean that he has the star only in one case out of those five. So for part E, one tenth over five tenths is equal to one fifth. And now here's the shortcut way to do this in your head. This always works. You say, OK, there are five pieces of cake and two stars. Paul has two chances in five of ending up with a star. The other four pieces of cake are strictly equivalent to one another. Elizabeth cracks one of them open. OK? There's a 
three chances in five that the star is in one of the three unopened pieces of cake. There's nothing to distinguish among those three open, unopened pieces of cake. And therefore, the probability of three-fifths that Paul doesn't have the star has to be divided among those three pieces of cake, giving you an answer of one-fifth. So uh, this asks you for a lot of interesting calculations, by the way. But uh, if you're a Monty Hall veteran, you know what the answer is uh, by using shortcut and perfectly legitimate techniques. Any questions about this? That even suggests maybe one could write a Monty Hall multiple choice question. OK, uh, next one. Well, we haven't had a binomial theorem question yet. An unprepared student takes a quiz consisting of four multiple choice questions, each with three possible answers. Knowing nothing about the subject, the student answers each question by rolling a die to choose randomly among the three answers, and so has a probability p equals one third of getting each question correct. So this question mixes conditional probability and the binomial distribution. It's similar to the cobble kybers question, which I put on the homework, though not quite as imaginative. What's the probability that the student gets precisely two correct answers? Well, uh, this is straight binomial. He's got to get two right answers, probability 1 third squared. He's got to get two wrong answers probability for that is 2 thirds squared. And then there are two of the four questions that he gets right. So there are four choose two ways of selecting the pair of questions he gets correct. And this is 6 times 4 over 81 or 24 over 81, which some folks might simplify to 8 27ths. Though I don't, I do not take off if you neglect to reduce your fractions to lowest terms. OK, what's the probability that the student gets fewer than two correct answers? If I've read part C first, I realize that I'll need the probability for zero correct and one correct individually. So. The probability of 0 correct is 2 thirds to the fourth. That's 16 over 81. And the probability of getting 1 correct is <coughs> 4 choose 1, for the question the student gets correct, times the probability of 1 third of getting it correct, times 2 thirds cubed for getting the other three wrong. And that's equal to 32 over 81. And the sum is 48 over 81. Now, at this point, I would say, since I still have an hour and a half to work on this exam, although nobody asked me what's the probability that you got three or four correct, it would be folly not to work out those probabilities and check that everything sums to 1. So given enough time to do it, the probability of getting 3 correct is equal to 4 choices for the one he gets wrong times uh, 1 third cubed times 2 thirds, and that's 8 over 81. And the probability of 4 correct is equal to 1 over 81. And my check is that 1 plus 8 plus 48 is 57 plus 24 is 81. So I've worked out the whole binomial expansion of 1 third plus 2 thirds to the fourth, and everything checks. 
OK? Uh, the last question is, uh, suppose the student gets an email saying, you failed the quiz. And he asks, oh goodness, what's the chance that I got them all wrong? The answer is it's part C. The conditional probability of 0 correct given 0 or 1 correct is equal to the probability of 0 divided by the probability of 0 union 1, if you don't mind my notation. And that's 1681 over 1681 plus 32, 81, which is 1 third. Questions about this? Hi, Chris. I got five minutes left, and I've got two questions. So I guess we'll have to run over onto a second tape. Why don't we Why don't we break now then? And I'll do the last two, and Chris can pass back the homework. Chris, whom the distance learners may never have seen, will explain. <laughs> What can be done by way of review? And you'll need the microphone. I'll just need it for a second. OK. Hi, everybody. The review is going to be on Monday. I know that's Martin Luther King Jr. Day, but let's see if you can make it. It's 5.30 to 7.30. For the first hour, I'll basically present problems, and I'll present solutions and topics that I think everybody had trouble with on all the different homeworks. And then for the second hour, I'll take your questions. I'm handing back all of the homework today so you can look through it. So it's 5.30 to 7.30, Monday the 16th, in the Science Center, room 109. You Does everyone know where the Science Center is? Science Center if you don't, you can go to uh, www.map.harvard.edu. What was again, Chris? 5.30 to 7.30. So it's on map.harvard.edu. It's slightly northeast of here. OK. okay. Okay, uh, I'll move on to question nine. Um, I should say, I'm going to get through all these questions in about half the allotted time. My rule of thumb when I was teaching physics is if I couldn't do an exam, five times faster than I was expecting the students to do it, it was going to turn out to be too long. And when I actually sat down to scribble out my answers to this one, it took me a little bit less than half an hour. So I think that's about right for giving people uh, two to two and a half hours. Uh, in spite of its paper consumption, uh, this is a perfectly reasonable two-hour exam. and. Uh, I think there will be people who are done after two hours. But um, I think two and a half hours should give everyone all the time they need to get everything they know down on the paper. OK, question nine. Oh, this looks like a random walk and bijection between paths question. And it is a reasonably easy one of this genre, provided you understand the general strategy and have seen it before. By establishing a bijection between paths, prove that the number of, quote, non-zero paths that start in level 0 and do not return to level 0 during 2m steps of a simple random walk is equal to the number of non-negative paths that start in level 0 and do not visit any negative level during 2n steps. And then, because I want a single right answer to grade, I've asked you, please, to associate non-zero paths that stay positive 
with non-negative paths whose last step is up. And uh, that is actually a useful reminder about how to do this. So. Now, I would say if a clever person was going to get one thing wrong on this exam, the obvious error to make is to neglect to do the bijection in both directions. That is, you have to show that this function is invertible. It's rather trivially invertible, but uh, you nonetheless have to point this property out in order to show that you have a bijection. So let's start with a path that is always positive. It has to go up. And subsequently, it can touch level 1 again, but it can never go down to level 0 because it wouldn't be a non-zero path if it touched 0 again. And all we have to do is treat this as the start of our non-negative path, and then tack on a single up step at the end. So this will go there. Yep? The way you drew it, it looks like you have one step and then the rest Basically, yes, I've done something good. misleading, Anna, haven't I? What I've done is uh, it has to be it has to be at least in level two uh, on the next last step. And I think there's something to be said for going right ahead and doing the first part of part B, which is show exactly what this bijection is in the case where you have paths with four steps. So we have u, 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 u goes to u, 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 u. That's easy enough. There are going to be three other all positive paths. Let's do u, 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 d. And this says take u, u, d, and tack on the u. And finally, we've got u, u, d, u, which goes back to level 1, but never to level 0. And that's u, d, u, and we tack on a u. So that matches up three of the non-zero paths, the ones that start with an up step, with three of the non-negative paths. Uh, now to finish off part A, the other possibility is that the first step is a downward step, and we've got an odd number of additional steps. Sorry. Odd. Five, which means that if the uh, path is always negative, it has to end up in level minus two. And the deal here is you take this part and flip it, and now you have a path that is never negative, and you tack on a downward step. So let's do these. D, 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 D goes to, we've got to flip this over, turning it into U, 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 D. We've got D, 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 U. 
We flip the last three steps over, getting u, u, d, followed by d. And we have d, d, u, d. Flip the last three steps over, u, d, u, followed by a final d. None of these can match any of these because these all end up with an upward step and these all end up with a downward step. And the rule for inverting this is simply, if you want to invert this function, look at the last step. If the last step is an upward step, start with an upward first step, and the rest of the path makes it stay positive. If the last step is down, start with a downward step, and then the Earlier steps with u's interchange for d's and d's for u's will guarantee you a path that uh, stays always negative. Uh, I stated that rather informally, but that would have been perfectly enough for full credit. Danny, you have a question? To make sure I got this wired, if yep. you remove the admonishment about uniformity of answers in the question, can you swap? Yes, you can. Downs Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it would be equally correct to say we'll tack on the reverse of the first step. Uh, that's invertible in the same way. So this is not a uh, unique bijection. Uh, it's just uh, one of at least two possibilities. And there are probably other ways of doing this, too, where you split off the last step. Uh, and <laughs> I'm wise enough not to leave these questions too open-ended because then you know, if there are 16 correct answers, then uh, I have a very hard time spotting any wrong answers. I have to go and check everything. Whereas this way, uh, everyone should get the same table here. Other questions about this? OK. Um, we've had no munchkins. Oh, and here are the munchkins, the Senate munchkins, question number 10 with the Homeland Security Committee. OK, uh, what's the deal? We've got six members on this committee, four Republicans and two Democrats. And uh, in this particular case, Thomas and Catherine don't have equal size bags because there's a two-member Homeland Subcommittee and there's a four-member Security Subcommittee. So the first question that we want to ask is, what goes in the denominator? How many ways are there of dividing six senators into a subcommittee of two and a subcommittee of four? And the answer is six choose two. Six times five over two which is 15. So there are 15 pairs of senators that could be chosen to serve on the Homeland Committee. And all we have to do is count up the number of ways of doing that with no Republicans, zero, one Republican, and uh, two Republicans. So we'll do event A0 first. Event A0 is the case where there are no Republicans on this committee but strictly along party lines, there's only one way of doing this. There's absolutely no choices involved. So the probability of this event is 1 over 15. What's the probability of getting one Republican on the Homeland Committee so that the makeup looks like this? The easy way to answer that question is to say, if you're going to do this, there are two choices for your 
uh, Democrat, and there are four choices for your Republican. So there are eight ways of selecting a pair consisting of one Republican and one Democrat. The probability of that one is 8 fifteenths. And finally, if both members of the Homeland Committee are going to be Republicans, we've got this situation. In this case, we choose two out of the four Republicans. That's 6 over 15. And I would say there's precious little point in reducing this to lowest terms because the check now is 1 plus 8 plus 6 equals 15. So the probability sum up to 1. If I only asked you two of these three questions and you had any time on your hands, you would have been very well advised to work out the third probability independently, just so you have this check of summing to one. Chris, a comment? OK, we turn the page, and it's conditional munchkins. A terrorist kidnaps a randomly chosen senator from the Security Committee and ascertains that this senator is a Democrat, event B. In other words, uh, Catherine pulls a munchkin out of her bag, and it's a plain one. Now, there are two ways of doing this, and I'm going to show you both of them, because in a question like this, again, if you have time to spare, there's no harm in doing the question both ways. Uh, remember, one way of doing a conditional probability question is to use the formula p of a given b is p of a intersect b divided by a phi of b. But you can also do the question by saying, well, let's consider event B has happened, and let's just do by straight counting the probabilities for event A under those circumstances. And you may recall the problem where your opponent had a poker hand with two exposed cards, both of which were aces, and you had to calculate the probability that your opponent had four aces. The way of saying, how many ways are there of choosing the remaining three cards to give four aces was actually a much shorter way of doing that problem. So sometimes one of these methods is more efficient. Sometimes the other is more efficient. And if you do them both, and they both give the same answer, uh, you can be really quite sure that you're correct because they lead to somewhat different calculations. OK, so let's do D, E, and F first the straightforward way. Well, what's the conditional probability uh, given that uh, a senator kidnapped from the uh, Security Committee was a Democrat, that there are uh, no Republicans on the Homeland Committee? That probability is a big zero because in that case, there's nothing but Republicans on the four-member committee, and you can't kidnap a Democrat from it. So the conditional probability that both Democrats were on this committee, given that we already know that there's a Democrat on that committee, is zero. That was easy. Now we should get two probabilities that sum to one. So we now want to know, what's the conditional probability given that a randomly chosen member of the Security Committee turned out to be a Democrat, that there's one Democrat and one Republican on this committee. So we have a situation like that. Well, here's one way of doing it. You can say that's the probability of A1 intersect B over the probability of B. And this is the probability of A1, which we calculated, times the probability of B given A1 over the probability of B. 
the probability of A1 worked out to 8 fifteenths. And if A1 has occurred, then there are three Republicans and a Democrat on this other committee. And if you snatch one of them at random, not knowing the person's party affiliation, you got one chance in four of getting the Democrat. There are long-winded ways of calculating P of B, but a perfectly good way of calculating P of B is to say these senators were distributed randomly between the two committees. The Democrat was snatched randomly from the committee that he's on. There are two Democrats and four Republicans, so there's one chance of three in getting a Democrat. So that is 2 fifteenths over 5 fifteenths which is two-fifths. I'll show you an easier way to do this in a minute. Now, at this point, you could say the probabilities have to sum to one, so this, w this has to be three-fifths, and I can't mark you wrong for that. Uh, I can say you exhibited bad judgment and were lucky because you can also do this directly, and then you get a free check. So this is the probability of A2 times the probability of B given A2 divided by the probability of B. The probability of A2, we said, was 6 fifteenths. The probability of B given A2 well, A2 means we got two Republicans here, two Democrats, two Republicans there. Pick one at random. There's a probability of one half that you got a Democrat. Divide by one third, and you got three fifteenths over five fifteenths, or three fifths. And what do you know? These sum to one. Now, here is another way of doing this. Another way of doing this is we can say, fine, we know that one of the members of the Security Committee is a Democrat. And then the question is simply, how many ways are there to divide up the remaining five senators of whom two are Democrats and, sorry, of whom one is a Democrat and uh, four are Republicans. So another way of doing this is to say, if you take um, three, four Republicans and a Democrat, there are Five choose two, which is ten ways of distributing them up, and the probability that you get one Republican over here under those circumstances is the number of ways of selecting one Republican to go with the Democrat. There are clearly four Republicans you can choose over ten, which is two fifths. And in a similar manner, for F, you can say the number of ways of getting two Republicans over here is there's four choose two ways of getting a repair of Republicans divided by 10. That's 6 tenths or 3 fifths. In this particular case, I think that's slightly simpler, but I prefer to use it as a check anyway. Have I made it all seem too easy? I mean, apart from the fact that 99% of the people in the world can't do these questions, it's really not that difficult. Uh, and anything on here that struck you as a curveball? I try not to put curveballs in an exam, so the answer I'm looking for is zero. Uh, yeah, Dana? 
the wording on the Monty Hall yeah, problem the might have been yeah. slightly improved by reminding us of the protocol in question. Yes, okay, that's a good point. Uh, I think I'm actually going to retire that Monty Hall problem anyway. Uh, or, or, sorry, I'm not going to retire it. I'm going to put it out to pasture as a homework question because it's, it's a nice question, but it's not a particularly good exam question. And, and I'll tell you why it's not a particularly good exam question. Uh, you've undoubtedly encountered this phenomenon in other courses. If you present the easiest case of something in class, then when exam time rolls around, you end up having to invent a harder question because you've already used up the easy one. And in the other course I'm teaching this term, Math 152, which I'm going to be, Anna took the summer school version of this, but I'm going to be offering a version in the extension school in the spring with the probability left out to make it fit. Uh, there's a lot of attention paid to two by two matrices where the entries are drawn from finite fields, which might have uh, one, two, three, four, or five elements in them. And I actually planned ahead on this. Uh, in the course, I do exhaustively the case for finite fields with four elements and finite fields with five elements, leaving the finite fields with two and three elements for homework and exam questions because they're computationally much simpler. Uh, and in a sense, what I probably should have done with Monty Hall is present a problem like this in class and then leave the really simple case with three doors as a quickie homework question. Yeah, Robert? Back in, I think it was question four, uh, where you have that um, uh, way of expanding the uh, uh, fourth power generating function. Yes. How do you get that, you know, the finite and the infinite, uh, the two the two factors that you, you know, if I can find it. Uh, yeah, oh, how did I? You separate. OK, so the question is, how did I get the expansion of binomial. It's a mix of the So the question is how do I do that? Yeah. And the answer is I think of it like this. And you know, spring this on people who've never seen it before. It's probably a nice question for this Putnam mathematics competition, where they ask lots of straightforward but almost impossible questions to try to figure out who are the brightest young mathematicians in the whole country. Uh, if you're really clever, you look at this never having seen it before and say, oh, if I write it like this, I can multiply the regular binomial expansion by the negative binomial expansion. But you've been shown the trick. OK, so now this one. And at this point, I say I already had four powers of uh, s over here. The next term is going to involve s to the 12th. And since I'm only being asked for the coefficient of uh, s to the 11th, that can't possibly be relevant to anything. That's why I write plus dot, dot, dot. There'd be nothing wrong with writing it all out, but uh, this is only an efficient method if you compute only the terms that are going to matter. If you compute all the terms, uh, it becomes rather a pain. This one, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, I said, I can never remember this formula, and that's why I want to look at page 14, and on page 14, which will also appear on uh, next week's exam, we have 1 minus q to the minus r equals the sum of r minus 1 plus i 
times choose r minus 1 over q sub i. Or perhaps even better, looking at the line above it, you can see that it's 1 plus 3 choose q, 3 choose 2q plus 4 choose 2q squared plus 5 choose 2q cubed. And therefore, this one is going to be 1 plus 4 choose 3s plus 5 choose 3s squared plus, and now the only term that's going to matter, because I had an s to the fourth here, is the one in s to the seventh, which has to be 10 choose 3s to the seventh. And it's true, this looks infinite, but we all know that uh, once you get a number that's so large you can't throw it on four dice, all the coefficients beyond that have to be zero. Uh, I'm sure this could be proved directly, but I would say if you write down the proof for that, you've probably got a nice derivation of an interesting combinatorial identity. Other questions about the exam? Questions for me or for Chris about anything else tonight? OK, well, uh, I wish you all best of luck uh, next week. I thank those of you who have faithfully come to all the live classes for your uh, attention, your good questions, and your <laughs> reactions that I hope gave me a good clue as to when I was being understood and whether I'd better say things again. And to those of you who are uh, only on video, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the course and you missed a chance to meet a really nice group of people in this room.